All right, who is subject to sanctions? So let's find out who is actually subject to sanctions. All right. There are two categories of those who are subject to sanctions. First are the individuals and entities re required to comply with sanctions. And second are those who are eligible targets of sanctions. Okay, so individuals and entities that are required to comply with sanctions. So, sanction, so everyone basically. And then those eligible targets of sanctions. Sanctions are applicable to everyone. While, for instance, an individual might not personally conduct due diligence on every vendor prior to buying a cup of coffee, that's true, <laughs> uh, in order to determine whether uh, coffee, in order to determine whether it is sanctioned, the buyer could be held liable. For example, if the beans were sourced from Iran, how, however unlikely complying with sanctions requires using a risk-based approach, even though guidance is provided on how best to comply with sanctions. It is not expected that the average citizen will have personally fully formed sanctions compliance program. Yeah, that's true. It's not cheap. Additionally, sanctions are a matter of jurisdiction. Citizens of a country and a permanent resident and a permanent resident. And a permanent resident. Um, where am I up to now? Must comply with sanctions regardless of whether they are outside their home country. This is true with the US, EU, and most autonomous sanctions. So, if you're a US citizen like me, I must, even though I'm in Australia right now, I must comply with sanctions in the US. If a, if the person is on vacation overseas, their country sanctions laws still apply. So, yeah, you can't go overseas and commit sanctions for on a holiday. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, there's not, uh, what you call, if a person is, uh, conservatively, any individual, regardless of citizenship, must comply with the sanctions and laws of any country they are physically in. So if you're not American, but you live in or in America, well then, you've got to comply with OFAC sanctions. The following is a summary of people and entities who must comply with OFAC regulations. You, okay, so this is big. I think this would be a question definitely exam. U.S. citizens and permanent residents wherever located. Companies and other entities organized under U.S. law. All people and organizations, whatever their origin, physically in the United States, and all branches of U.S. companies and other entities throughout the world. Note that for legal entities, the rules are similar for in to those for people. Any legal entity physically located in a jurisdiction is subject to that jurisdiction. So foreign branches, agencies, and subsidiaries in the U.S. must comply with U.S. sanctions, and any foreign branches agencies, subsidiaries are physically located within the territory of the EU, including its airspace, must comply with EU sanctions. The principle will be guiding, will generally apply to all autonomous sanctions. In its 2012 guideline on implementation and evaluation of restrictive measures for sanctions, in its framework for the EU common foreign security policy, the EU expressly stated that sanctions will impose Will poses will apply only when the links to the EU are present. So in paragraph 88, the guidelines state that regulations shall apply, this is for EU, within the territory of the European Union, including its airspace, interesting, on board any aircraft or vessel under the jurisdiction of a member state, to any person inside or outside the territory of the European Union who is a national of a member state, to any legal person, entity or body outside or, or inside or outside of the territory of the U European Union, which is incorporated or constituted under the law of the member state to any legal person, entity or body in respect of any business done in whole in parts within the European Union. In the US, legal entities organized under US law and their foreign branches must comply with US sanctions. The same holds true for legal entities and their branches that are organized under the laws of the EU jurisdiction, for example, UK legal entities established under UK law, including their branches, must also comply with UK financial sanctions in force, irrespective of where their activities take place. However, under EU sanctions, a company subsidiaries located and doing business outside the EU are not subject to EU sanctions. Okay, so that's interesting. So if your European Union is, your European bank is doing some work in the US, well, then it's not subject to European sanctions, but it's actually subject to US sanctions. 
this does not apply to branches of EU companies as branches are not distinct legal entities. So that's why a lot of European banks in Europe are actually branches. They're not like, some of them are, but some actually aren't like US corps, they're, they're branches. Although EU sanctions are not extraterritorial, the EU may issue anti-circumvention legislation preventing EU companies from circumventing EU sanctions by using non-EU subsidiaries of proxy. For example, in the context of Ukraine-Russia related sanctions, Article 12, Council Regulation 833214, prohibits companies from participating knowing intentionally in activities that the object of effect which to circumvent the prohibitions, including acting as a substitute for entries, entities. Okay. But if sanctions regime do not necessarily have a prescriptive rules that must be followed regardless of the potential for a violation to occur, such as a legal requirement to collect identifying information on a customer, then when do financial institutions spend so much money on these programs? The answer is that domestically governments regulate compliance with sanctions through penalties, including fines and imprisonment. All right, so there's the penalties. In respect, there may not be much difference between the coffee shop at the exit of the subway and the large financial institution at which compliance professionals work. Both are subject to the same fines and penalties that may result from a sanctions breach. I guess it's trying to say here that sanctions applies everywhere, whereas like AML applies specifically. You know, both are subject to the same fines and penalties that may result from a sanctions breach. However, because the cost of a coffee, three dollars twelve, and it's coffee is not three dollars twelve these days and its sale of a sanctioned target would have little impact on undermining the purpose of a sanctions regime compared to the remittance of a $50,000 wire to a sanctioned target in a sanctioned country. Some industries, like financial institutions, should have robust sanctions compliance programs. So the risk is much lower, but the, well, no, sorry, the consequences are much lower. The risk is probably still equal. <laughs> Given the large exposure financial institutions may have to potential sanctions violations and to the large firm fines that may occur, financial institutions may be regulated for sanctions compliance as a matter of safety and soundness to their financial health. The US is a well-known example of this. The US enforces sanctions compliance program on regulated institutions as a matter of safety and soundness. This means that sanctions violations may result in penalties so large that the safety and soundness of the financial institution is placed in jeopardy. To help firms avoid sanctions violations and penalties, OFAC released a framework for OFAC compliance commitments, providing guidance and compliance programs. These are not regulations with which non-compliance could lead to found violations, rather the agency guiding to help firms avoid sanctions, violations, penalties, etc. It is also important to keep in mind that while economic sanctions apply to property, the term property is a broadly based definition defined to include much more than money, trade goods in the US uh, terms property and property interests include checks, merchandise, trademarks, annuities, and a broad array of interests defined by US law. Okay, the, the broad definition would, have, would include virtually all financial and commercial activities, so that's property, everything. Although there are sanctions such as travel bans that do not involve property, economic sanctions have by far the most implications for a sanction compliance program. All right, cool, facilitation. A different restriction which can have broad geographic reach and concerns activities described under the US sanctions regime as facilitation or approval. The prohibition of facilitation is found under 31 CFR 506-2A and reads, except as otherwise authorized pursuant to this part and notwithstanding any contract entered into or license or permit granted prior to May 7, 1995, no United States person, wherever located, may approve, finance, facilitate, or guarantee any transaction by a foreign person where that transaction by a foreign person would prohi be prohibited in the part if performed by a United States person within the United States. Okay, so what does this mean? This essentially means that a U.S. person may not facilitate or assist activities of a non-U.S. person if those activities would violate sanctions. Okay. If the non-US person were a US person, this applies to US persons anywhere in the world. In other words, a US person cannot indirectly do what she is directly prohibited from doing. So you can't indirectly help someone do sanctions anywhere in the world. The same rules basically apply. That's what it looks like. This offense has attracted particular attention when financial institutions and other companies have employed members of senior management who are considered US persons under the US sanctions regime.
as well as when U.S. consultants have worked overseas for financial institutions. Yes, yeah, so a lot of, when you're dealing with people who've got U.S. indicia, it always complicates things. A simple example of facilitation would be if a U.S. citizen working as a director of a European company took part in a business decision to enter a deal with a company in Iran. Other types of facilitation would include U.S. employees working for a branch in the U.S., advising its parent overseas on conducting transactions that would otherwise be prohibited if they were to engage in them. Uh, the purpose of the prohibition and facilitation is to prevent the evasion of sanctions, although through direct actions, examples of prohibited activities include, the f among, among others, the following. The U.S. parties may not approve, finance, or guarantee any transaction which they themselves are prohibited from engaging. U.S. parties may not provide merchandise to be used in connection with a prohibited transaction or make a purchase for the benefit of a prohibited transaction. U.S. parties may not uh, provide services in support or in connection with prohibited activity. U.S. parties may not provide guidance on prohibited activity. U.S. parties may not alter their corporate policies to allow for prohibited transactions. U.S. parties may not refer to business to a foreign person that would involve a prohibited transaction. I hope you're starting getting this here. I'm still getting my head around it as well. At the other end of the spectrum of conduct, activities that are purely clerical or reporting related, such as reporting on a subsidiary's tirade trade with a sanctioned country, would not necessarily constitute facilitation. All right. Case example, Schlumberger Oilfield, massive oil company. Schlumberger Oilfield Holdings, or Schlumberger Oilfield, is incorporated in the BVI, but has its headquarters in Houston, so its primary business in Houston for its, I guess, its U.S. oil operations. But it's still, that subsidiary is still um, domiciled in the BVI. A multi-billion dollar oil and gas conglomerate, Schlumberger Limited, is incorporated in the Netherlands, and Tilly's uh, Curacao, which is, a you know, the Dutch offshoot. Beginning in February 20, 2004, Schlumberger walked with Schlumberger to Oilfield Drilling Emergent Segment in Houston. By doing so, Schlumberger Oilfield knowingly violated sanctions by systematically approving and disguising capital expenditure requests from operations in Iran and Sudan for the manufacture of new tools and for certain expenditures, directing and overseeing the transfer of oilfield equipment from projects in non-sanctioned countries to projects in Iran and Sudan, making and implementing a business decision specifically concerning projects in Iran and Sudan, providing certain technical services in order to troubleshoot mechanical failures and to sustain sophisticated oil field service equipment in Iran and Sudan. So it's all basically avoiding sanctions in Iran and Sudan. And that's basically what they're doing here. They use like a different offshoot to conduct, to circumvent US sanctions. While the Houston operations do not directly engage in this activity, it provides support to its parent company to facilitate transactions that could not do itself. Key takeaways. Facilitation is a concept that applies to U.S. persons not directly engaged in the same activity. Facilitation is a broad concept that may encompass a variety of activities, such as overseeing the transfer of equipment for a non-U.S. person to sanctioned locations. U.S. persons are prohibited from making business decisions on behalf of non-U.S. persons for projects in sanctioned countries. Providing technical and advisory expertise for operations in sanctioned countries may be prohibited as facilitation. Extraterritorial of sanctions programs. Interesting. Extraterritorial jurisdiction or extraterritoriality is the ability of the state to basically to go outside their borders legally to make, apply, and enforce laws, regulations, and other rules of conduct in respect to persons, property, or activity beyond its territory. The U.S. is the primary government engaged in applying extraterritorial to its sanctions regime. The EU, believing that the practice of extraterritorial violates international law, interesting, does not allow for the concept of extraterritorial in relation to sanctions restrictions it imposes. The EU describes extraterritorial sanctions as sanctions that non-U.S. citizens and companies are also expected to comply with outside the jurisdiction of the U.S. These sanctions are also known as the secondary sanctions as opposed to primary sanctions. There's definitely a question on that. What's primary sanctions and what's secondary sanctions? As stated in its 2002 guidelines and implementation and evaluation of sanctions, the EU expressly states that sanctions it imposes will only apply where links to the EU are present. Primary sanctions. The EU also follows this concept when implementing sanctions introduced by the U UN. The purpose of secondary sanctions stems from the globalization weakening
the impact of the primary sanctions as an alternative, fi alternative finance and trade becoming more available. However, people often misunderstood the idea of extraterritoriality, taking it to means that restrictions imposed by EU sanctions cannot apply to persons or activities once they are outside the EU's geographical borders. Very interesting. Wherever they are in the world. Case example, Honda Finance 2017. American Honda Finance Company entered into a settlement agreement for $87,000 to settle potential liability regarding 13 transactions that appear to violate U.S. sanctions against Cuba. AFHE is headquartered in California, United States, and is a motor vehicle finance company. AHFC has a majority-owned subsidiary, Honda Canada Finance, located in Canada. Between February 2011 and February 2014, Honda Finance Canada financed 13 lease agreements between unaffiliated Honda dealerships in Ottawa, Canada and the Embassy of Cuba. AHFC voluntarily disclosed the transactions and OFAC determined the violations were non injurious U.S. sanctions programs, key takeaways, U.S. sanctions programs apply to subsidiaries of U.S. companies operating outside the jurisdiction of the U.S. For example, Cuban and Iranian programs, sanctions compliance programs, should understand the full scope of applicability of sanctions programs based on their risk exposure. Financing provided between an affiliated company and a sanctioned entity falls in the scope of U.S. sanctions. In relation to U.S. embargoes, the U.S. application of extraterritoriality forbids non-U.S. persons to export goods that are of U.S. origin or contain content part of U.S. origin to embargoed countries. This prohibition of re-import, so it's trying to circumvent it again, has a broad reach while licenses can be obtained to allow these transactions as a general policy, these licenses are denied.